being a nice Jewish kid from New York, one of my favorite recipes to do is a version of my grandmother's corned beef, um, which is why I'm holding this giant uh, plastic container. Um, these types of containers are very, very handy for home cooks to have, uh, but for this dish, you're gonna want one that is at least half this size uh, and at least uh, half as high because we need to soak this beautiful piece of brisket and let it cure for about 10 days. But the results are unbelievable. Uh, first thing that I want to do is trim off some of this extraneous fat. Don't use a very big knife uh, to trim your meat. Uh, you're going to have much more control with a smaller knife, six or eight inches, that you choke up on. It's kind of like uh, when you played baseball as a kid and they said, if you want back control, choke up on it. I like knives that I can put my hand up and over, so I actually shorten this and I can turn this into a four or five inch paring knife. I want a lot of control over the sharp part of my blade because I don't want to cut myself. I want to be very precise. So I want to leave some of the fat on here because you know fat is flavor and I want to balance that out with the lean. When this eventually cooks, a lot of this fat is going to liquidize and wind up in our water that ends up going down the drain. But by the same token, there's an awful lot of extraneous fat all over this piece of meat. So I'm going to take this strip off just because it ends up being the thickest piece. And as it comes down to the tail here, just be very careful of your fingers. You can feel where it's thick. I can feel right there, I have a nice big thick piece of fat. And I'm just gonna shave some of this away. I can feel with my fingers it's a little thicker here. And you see the way I'll pull up a flap and then hold on to it? That's just knife safety 101. That way I know I can trim and I'm laying my knife flat against the meat. I'd rather go over a section a second time than cut away too much fat or cut myself. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna square this off so that it cures evenly and it cooks evenly. This piece of meat isn't even. And so this meat, some folks like to render beef fat for different uses in the kitchen. I always like to take trim like this and while it's in my hand, cut it for stew, put it in a Ziploc bag into my refrigerator. One and a half inch squares is pretty good with brisket. Don't get into analysis paralysis. It doesn't come squared off. You're gonna have some pieces that look different than others, but if you do this a couple times, you'll wind up with a few pounds of meat that can be beautiful for a beef stew in your house. And now we have what is generically considered to be the flat of the beef. So I have my trimmed piece of brisket. I'm going to put that into my container. You can see I left lots of room in there. The one thing you don't want to do is cheat yourself on room. That's very, very important. You don't want just barely covered here because air might get in and if air gets in, because you're trying to create an anaerobic environment for curing, if air gets in, you can create molds. You wanna make sure that it's covered with the curing mixture. And I'm just gonna grab some cold water. Okay, so I have this covered by about an inch of water, which is exactly uh, what I want. And I'm just gonna slowly add my ingredients and stir them together. This is paprika. I like to get a nice red color on this and the paprika helps. I have brown sugar. Don't worry about little hard lumps in your brown sugar, but I do like to break it up so that it does dissolve in the water efficiently. I've got a couple of bay leaves there. I've got my allspice my peppercorns, some granulated garlic. This is conventional pickling mix. All the other stuff that's in here is in the pickling mix, but I've got some cloves and mustard seed and little bits of chili and 
fennel and other things in there that help. So I'm sort of doctoring up a conventional mix. And then this is the most important thing. This is called prog powder or butcher salt. Um, it's available online uh, in stores, online stores all over the net. You can also get it now at most specialty uh, food shops because curing meat has become so popular. Um, that salt, that curing salt, um, has the ability to both cure the meat, but also has the ability to keep the meat looking pink and fresh inside. And it's used in hams and other cured meat arts all over the world. Terrines of many kinds use it. I'm just turning this a couple times so that I can dissolve all of that sugar and prog powder in there. I wanna make sure when my hands, and I like to use my hands, the most important tool in the kitchen, uh, on this so I can actually feel that there's nothing in the bottom there that's not dissolved. Uh, don't be fooled. The paprika and some of those other seasonings don't dissolve. So you'll feel those little grains, but you won't feel the sugar and salt in the bottom. And I'm just gently moving my brisket back and forth in there just to make sure it's dissolved. And then I'm going to leave my brisket fat side up in this curing mixture. So at this point, and, and by the way, any non-reactive container that you have will do. Non-reactive things like stainless steel, really well-glazed china. If it has any chips, it's not going to be the right environment for your food. Don't use anything that has aluminum or copper or other soft metals in it. Cast iron won't work. Uh, but any kind of foodproof uh, plastic is actually really ideal. So this goes into your refrigerator and just mark your calendar. So through the magic of video, we actually have a corned beef that I did over a week ago. And so we can go right to the cook-off process. And I have some stock here because I like to poach this finished product in stock because I think it adds a lot to the flavor of the corned beef itself. You're not going to use that for anything else. You can't reduce it, it's gonna to be too salty, it's got all the cure in it. But cooking in that flavorful stock that we're going to add some aromatics to, some cinnamon, some mustard seed, peppercorns, more bay leaf. So what I did was if you remember, we had that whole flat. I cut that flat in half. This actually cured in about six days. And I want to just rinse that cure off the outside. You don't need to soak it. It's just that I don't need all of those other curing flavors that actually preserved the meat in the pot that I'm going to cook it in. So here we have a nice, cleaned, half a flat, of beautiful brisket and we're gonna put that into our pot and we're gonna let, you know, that size, three hours. It's a very easy test to see if the corned beef is ready. Technically, now that it's cured, you could eat it raw, nothing would happen to you. But we wanna cook through and we wanna cook through long enough for the internal temperature to reach about 175 degrees so that the connective tissue and the collagen that's in the brisket breaks down enough to make it essentially spoon tender, but still firm enough that we can slice it. That's the key, getting it just at that exact moment where it's absolutely perfect. This piece that we've just cooked off is the horn or nose of the brisket that has that fatty rise at the end. And the reason why that's important, and by the way, the test for this thing, you can put a spoon in and turn it, it's nice and done. But this fatty rise that's right here, some people like to cut it off and just have it for unglazed corned beef sandwiches or chef's nibbles or stuff like that. But for me, what I am removing it for is so that I have a beautiful piece of corned beef that I can glaze evenly underneath my broiler. 
And so all I'm going to do is combine my molasses, a little bit of dry mustard powder, some bourbon, please use a good one. Alcohol of any kind, as it reduces and you cook with it, reveals more of its flaws. So you want to start with something that is good. The best rule of thumb for cooking with wine or alcohol is that if you wouldn't serve it to your best friend on his birthday or her birthday, don't cook with it. Now I'm stirring here because molasses is notoriously finicky for dissolving in other liquids. It's very thick. I'm gonna add some brown sugar to this. Now some people like to put hot chilies or mustard or, you know, ketchup into it and give it a different flavor profile. By all means, go ahead. I, I like this more sort of traditional Southern approach with the bourbon molasses and brown sugar. And I use the dry mustard very specifically so I get some of that mustard flavor without making this too liquidy. Now, I am not stirring to dissolve the brown sugar. That I'd be stirring here for a little while or I'd have to heat it. I actually want some of that brown sugar to not dissolve because it's gonna help stick to this. Now, I will tell you, this is easier to glaze if you don't have a hot corned beef. My problem is I'm always cooking it and then wanting to serve it right away. So I've sort of tackled this problem by making enough glaze and doing this underneath the broiler so that I can come back to my meat two or three times and glaze again and again and again. Do not get into analysis paralysis about covering this downslope. Every piece of meat is gonna be different. And after you get the first layer kind of sticky and tacky, this next baste with our, our molasses mixture is gonna to adhere to it a lot better. And because this is hot, I don't need to roast it in the oven. I just stick it underneath the broiler. And I've preset the broiler about 15 minutes ago so that I'm not putting it into a cold oven with a hot element on top of it. My oven is nice and warm. So we just slide this in and it's just gonna take a couple minutes. Do not leave the kitchen at this point. Three hours of simmering, sure, leave the kitchen. Don't leave the kitchen while that's underneath the broiler because if you put too much heat and you start to burn the sugars in there, you're gonna get a bitter tasting crust on top of something that you've spent 10 days or at a minimum three or four hours working on. So you just stay right here. Ooh, you can see that sizzling. And that's just been about mm, 60 seconds. But I like the glaze. So on goes more. And you see what I said about not caring about it coming down that down slope? You're gonna get plenty as we begin to slice this. And I'm gonna put this back under the broiler for another 30, 40 seconds. And I'm gonna go one more round on this just because that wonderful molasses bourbon mustard trio really plays beautiful counterpoint to the somewhat salty cured meat. I wouldn't describe it as overly salty, but corned beef definitely has a salt profile. I don't care about anything burning on the side here because we're not gonna eat that. We're just gonna eat the stuff that's on top of here that's being insulated. Remember, you cannot burn or scorch or brown food in the presence of moisture. So on the top of here, this is just staying perfect as long as you keep your eye on it. I mean, <laughs> you don't even wanna eat it and that brown sugar bourbon molasses glaze is just absolutely fantastic. So we lift that out, place it on our board. Don't throw this away. 
while that's resting, let's do a couple things. First thing, if you have soft butter, you can spread it right on the bun. This bun, because I'm gonna make a sandwich, has a very, very delicate crumb. So all I'm going to do is stick that in my pan and let that melt. And we'll just let those pieces of bread griddle and get warm. Keep a nice eye on them. You don't want them to burn, just like with the broiler, that's a hot environment. Beautiful. Beautiful. We don't want those overcooking. While that is sitting there, I'm gonna add my mayonnaise. I like Russian dressing with this. I'm a nice Jewish kid from New York. Little sweet relish. I use Heinz chili sauce for this, just because I think it has better flavor for Russian dressing than ketchup. Some people call this Thousand Island. I was growing up, we called it Russian dressing. I'm right, everyone else is wrong. So what I wanna do is actually slice it at an angle like this, so that by the time I get all the way across it, I'm never going with the grain. I'm always against the grain. Make sense? So take a look at the way the two lines of muscles go and then slice in such a way you get it. By the way, when you see some of the brown sugar fall off like that, you actually know you've let it cool enough before we slow. We just, you know, a couple minutes, but enough so that that wonderful sticky molasses brown sugar mixture almost becomes like savory toffee on top of the corned beef. And this is still warm. Anything that runs hasn't burnt. So don't scrape down from the edges. Pour a little bit of that extra glaze on top of there. So, let's distribute the fat and the lean appropriately. Yeah, let's do this New York style and make it nice and fat. A dollop of Russian dressing. Don't kill your guests. Don't put three tablespoons on and let it all run all over the place. Just serve them a nice sandwich like this. Let them help themselves to whatever size you might put out when it's sandwich time, coleslaw, potato salad, whatever. And keep the bowl of Russian dressing handy so that if people want more, they can add more. Bourbon molasses glazed corned beef. Mm. PFG. Mm.